Okay, good morning to everyone. This is Andrea Ferretti from CNR Nano, uh, Modena Italy, part of the uh, MAX uh, Center of Excellence, and uh, welcome to this webinar. Today's uh, title is uh, Industry and Materials Design at the Exascale, Bridging, Bridging the Gap. The main idea of this webinar is basically to introduce computational materials modeling and to explain how this can be and interact with uh, high performance computing at the exascale level and how this uh, most importantly can help uh, industrial uh, studies and how we can can we bridge to uh, industrial needs so here is the agenda of our webinar today uh, besides this introduction uh, i'll give a very first uh, overview of what the uh, uh, Max UE is electronic structure and materials modeling and some exascaling uh, concepts. Uh, then uh, we'll have um, uh, uh, other talks from uh, Nicola Marzari, PFL, Pablo Rejon, ICN2, Stefano Baroni, Sista Trieste, Carlo Cavazzoni, Cineca, and Gerard Goldbeck, uh, EMMC. Basically, we will uh, illustrate and discuss some. Uh, uh, studies done in, uh, together with the industries, uh, highlighting how can uh, materials modeling can help. Uh, in those cases, we'll then reach to uh, services uh, uh, out of high performance computing targeted to industry and SMEs, uh, and eventually we'll conclude discussing the impact of materials modeling in uh, industry. Importantly, as you see here, we'll have um, two slots, five minutes each for question and answers. So please, uh, during uh, speaker's talk, just collect uh, your questions. Some of them have, uh, have already been received by us in advance, uh, but uh, you'll have the possibility to raise your hand during this Q&A time, and we'll take care of, uh, of this. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, one more uh, uh, few words about uh, who is attending today. So uh, we have a total up to I think yesterday evening of 47 uh, attendees registered. I think we are doing quite well in terms of uh, diversity and uh, we, we have uh, basically attendees from over uh, eight different countries in Europe and also uh, a fifth of them uh, from overseas. I think it's quite good. I'm also very happy to see that uh, there's a strong industrial participation uh, also from very diverse fields uh, gender balance uh, I think it's improvable but uh, we're still uh, doing rather well here okay so let me uh, start with the, uh, my own introduction of the max center and uh, some basic concepts in electronic structure and materials modeling high performance computing and exascaling during this talk, basically, I'll uh, introduce materials modeling and then exascaling at first, uh, and uh, briefly I'll switch to the description of the MAX, uh, materials uh, design at the exascale, center of excellence, giving a bit of context and also describing some of the activities this center uh, runs on a daily basis, and eventually try to conclude discussing what can MAX do for you uh you as industrial users so uh, let's come first to materials uh, and uh, uh, basically materials today are at the very core of a, a number of industrial uh, tasks and societal grand challenges and just to name a few uh, materials are core to energy harvesting conversion storage uh, are very key to uh, high-tech manufacturing up to uh, environmental issues or biomedical applications and uh, as it will be shown by the other speakers there's no doubt that uh, modeling uh, can surely help accelerating this discovery and i think some very nice uh, cases uh, will be uh, presented by the next speakers in turn, modeling then uh, relates to codes uh, and, uh, and data, and in particular, how data are produced uh, by our codes, uh, meaning if you want workflows, uh, and how then data can be used, handled, and eventually analyzed uh, if you want reaching 
up to data analytics. So coming to material science, as of today, we already have uh, enough uh, compute power basically to use methods that are directly rooted to quantum mechanical principles. And this basically allow us to have an atomistic uh, first principle description of materials. This means that uh, uh, not only these methods are uh, very accurate, but they are also predictive, meaning that uh, we don't need to provide in input uh, parameters that are material specific or specific to a class of materials. Uh, we have general parameters and out of this we can really be predictive and in turn this uh, atomistic um, quantum mechanical method can be combined uh, with multi-scale approaches uh, reaching to uh, larger scales as needed by material science. Uh, it's important to, to stress here that these methods are highly accurate but also computationally demanding so we already have a case for some uh, strong usage of uh, uh, compute, computational uh, machines and so excess scale that as I show in a second comes with the opportunity of providing us with much more computational power uh, is really an opportunity here so uh, I hear at least three different uh, ways we can exploit exascaling. So surely we can improve our modeling, meaning that we can have a modeling closer to the reality of the uh, problem. We, we can include more complexity in there. Uh, on the other side, with more compute power, we can surely uh, adopt methods with higher accuracy. In all these quantum mechanical methods, we have hierarchies of accuracy. So, uh, we can make sure that the accuracy we use is compatible with the prediction we want to make on the target material. And uh, interestingly, there's also a third avenue that is the one of running many calculations. So to perform and to push the idea of uh, uh, running high throughput screening of materials property where we may want to optimize some uh, uh, material with a given property in mind, okay? This we can do by screening uh, thousands, tens of thousands uh, of materials. And this is now feasible and efficient. This, this is going to be discussed in detail later on. So let me now come to exascaling. So what is the exascale challenge? As you all know, exa means 10 to the 18 here. Exascale means one side 10 to the 18 flops of floating point operation per second. That is compute power. At the same time, uh, just to give a reference, uh, today's biggest machine is about 200 uh, petaflops, so it's a uh, factor five, far from uh, this limit, but um, uh, machines uh, all over the world are a uh, few tens, if you want, of uh, petaflops. On the other side, we also have exabytes, meaning the 10 to the 18 bytes, meaning that uh, we want to be able to address, to produce, to handle, to get information from a large amount of data. And the most important point of this slide is that this is not going to happen simply by evolving the current technology we have. Uh, in other words, we need uh, abrupt technological changes, so we need to change the technological paradigm here, and the reason is mostly uh, related to power consumption. If we were evolving to this technology, uh, computation would take too much power and would not turn out to be feasible. In a sense, uh, this is a requirement uh, for going both uh, powerful, performing and green. That is an interesting uh, combination. So, uh, second message here is that if uh, we were, were not doing anything, uh, we are pretty sure we won't be able to fully exploit these new technologies. So action is actually needed. And let me uh, discuss this, illustrate this by uh, looking at the situation in the US. There we already have the Summit machine that is uh, based on NVIDIA, NVIDIA GPUs, so it's uh, heterogeneously accelerated by means of GPUs. And there are two more machines planned in the next year, year and a half. Aurora at Argon, based on Intel accelerators, and uh, uh, Frontier based on uh, um, AMD CPUs and AMD GPUs. So basically, we have three different architectures with three different software stacks, and uh, that need to be targeted, in a sense. 
And uh, this is complicated by some other uh, technology disruption, like uh, the presence of multiple memory hierarchies. I'm pretty sure that uh, Carlo Cavazzoni may answer questions about uh, this in uh, the Q&A slots. So what happens at the European level? So last year, the EuroHPC joint undertaking initiative, uh, initiative has been launched. Uh, EuroHPC is a legal funded ent entity, a, a, a very large initiative made of 28 uh, member states plus the European Commission. And as you can see from the budget, uh, is a, a very massive investment. And uh, the goal of this initiative is to develop uh, not just the machine, but the whole HPC ecosystem, meaning again, machines, but also application software machines would be useless if we don't have software scientific software able to exploit them but also data handling and eventually training because these are very complex uh, tools that need proper training in this scenario uh, concerning applications uh, the nine center of excellence have been funded by the Commission across multiple disciplines and MAX is the center of excellence that targets uh, materials uh, science and materials design. So as the European Institute for Materials Design, uh, the main concept of MAX is that besides the technological disruption that uh, we know is going to happen, is already happening actually, we also want to be able to have disruptive innovation in the way simulations and discovery of materials uh, are uh, obtained. And in the MAX concept, this is done by combining uh, highly predictive first principle methods that, that, that I just discussed uh, with the extreme computing power that is going to be provided by, the, uh, by reaching the exascale. Okay, here is a, a brief overview of the MAX partnership. On one side, we have the technology actors, so we have the five tier zero uh, HPC uh, centers uh, in Europe, so the biggest uh, uh, HPC supercomputing centers. And MAX is uh, built around a number of uh, open source electronic structure codes that are, uh, let's say, the best, uh, the, the most successful open source codes in, uh, in the field and importantly we have uh, uh, a number of scientific institutions with the developers of each of the codes. So we combine the developers of these open source codes with the technologists and also we have a couple of uh, companies active in uh, uh, hardware because we need uh, support concerning technological and hardware issues. Uh, so here are some keywords concerning the MAX COE. Uh, MAX is built, as I said, around codes. These are open source and perform quantum mechanical simulation. That is the heaviest step in the uh, simulations we uh, want to perform. And uh, we want to have these codes being able to exploit the new machines uh, uh, that are going to come and be performing and optimized on these machines. We want to be able to run, uh, to combine high performance computing with high throughput computing, so high throughput screening, as I mentioned at first. Uh, eventually, with also high performance data analytics, so we'll see a convergence of these teams. And uh, uh, a strong keyword here is uh, to have in place hardware and software uh, co design as a practice. So to learn from hardware manufacturers and to provide feedback to them concerning uh, user needs. And of course, uh, uh, these codes are community codes. They are written and made for users. Uh, and there is a strong uh, emphasis on engaging with these communities, training them, and so on and so forth. Providing services to them, as I'll show in a second. Here is a slightly more detailed list. There is also a, a bit of numbers concerning the impact. Uh, of this code, so I'll leave this slide here uh, for reference. Now, let me come to a slightly uh, more practical example what the activity of the COE is daily. Here, uh, discussing performance portability of uh, our codes, uh, I'll show an example where uh, together working with NVIDIA engineers, uh, we've been porting Quantum Espresso and Yambo 
on uh, GPU-based systems. Basically, we've been performing together with the personnel profiling of these codes after the porting, and uh, eventually we were able to achieve uh, uh, a, uh, a very good performance on the accelerated system. And uh, uh, so this is a very uh, first very uh, relevant achievement that is going to be followed by porting and uh, ideally uh, exploitation of these other accelerator technologies that are uh, in, uh, in view. Here is uh, another case uh, where we've been doing something very similar, working with Intel engineers uh, when the KNL Xeon Phi technology came out. We've been working with them and we were able uh, to achieve uh, some very good performance also on this uh, uh, architecture. Uh, another example that could be of interest is in the interaction with independent software vendors, uh, so private companies selling software suites. And here, may, uh, may not be trivial, but uh, uh, we did the exercise of uh, uh, understanding which kind of business model can be put in place with these vendors. and. Uh, uh, the, this operation turned out to be very successful. Here is the uh, quantum expression betting in the Schrodinger Maestro suite, but this was also uh, done uh, by Siesta, was embedded in the J uh, Opta suite. And importantly, besides, I mean, knowing that these uh, suites are there and are available, uh, I'd like to stress that this also means that this software has been proven to reach industry standards for uh, what concerns both the software but also the outcome and the reliability of the uh, of the code themselves so industry standards uh, uh, are, are met so last but not least i left this here on purpose uh, this is a list uh, of uh, industrial success stories i'm not entering the details since this is going to be discussed by the next speakers uh, pablo ordejon uh, and Stefano Baroni and Nicola Marzari. So uh, let me just leave this here as a placeholder and let me try to conclude uh, with a couple of slides. What can we, what can Max do for you? And surely the first answer is codes. And let me just remark some of the features of this code. They are open source, so available. You can look inside, see what is actually implemented and importantly these codes are powerful so have been demonstrated to be run with performance on uh, high performance computing and interesting green so they've been demonstrated to run on these greener machines uh, with uh, uh, reduced computational uh, power so reduced uh, power consumption sorry uh, also, these codes match industry standards, uh, and uh, as external users, uh, there are a number of modules and libraries that are ready to go, that have been uh, packed and can be used, for instance, by uh, external uh, private tools you may have at your company. And all of these come with automated uh, workflows to run and to compute complex properties that may require a careful uh, workflow of different calculations. Second point is consulting and support. So if you have a problem and there's an HPC solution, we can help here. We have uh, dedicated uh, consulting services that can be uh, discussed directly with anyone. Uh, just please contact us. We have uh, training activities since, as I said, these tools are complicated and uh, we provide training both concerning the materials modeling part and the HPC and the two combined so how to run these codes on uh, an HPC uh, machine and then uh, all kind of other support uh, related to the codes also uh, reaching up to containers and containerization of the software such that you can just download a container image and place it on your local cluster and you'll have a uh, uh, very nicely done environment and uh, you're sure you can get the performance uh, out of it. Uh, one last remark before concluding is that here I've been talking about exascaling, meaning that today's frontier of uh, uh, high performance computing is like racing, but if this is today's in uh, the frontier, it's going to be 
tomorrow in a commodity cluster. So it's something that is not just related to people willing to run at extreme scale. It's something that is pervasive of uh, to everyone willing to run uh, computations. Okay, and with this, I conclude. Thank you for the attention. So if you have any questions, as I said, please collect them. There's a chat uh, or uh, raise your hand during the Q&A time. Uh, now I'll uh, be happy to pass uh, the mic over to Professor Nicola Marzari from EPFL, who is uh, going to discuss about uh, the use of high throughput computing in uh, uh, material science. Nicola? Great. So, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, very well, right. thanks. So, I'll take over from Andrea uh, and really do a deep dive on uh, where we stand on uh, materials modeling and in particular material discovery and the prediction of complex material properties uh, with a special attention and focus on what is uh, relevant for industrial uh, applications. And uh, let me start uh, restating uh, the obvious, uh, that is uh, uh, what I call our entire business model of our field um, uh, relies on this uh, you know, sustained increase in throughput capacity during the years, uh, doubling actually every 14 months for the past 30 years. Uh, that means uh, that uh, we have seen, uh, say, in the last 30 years, uh, uh, a 33 million fold increase in capacity. And that's what's interesting about uh, computational science. Um, Andrea, I think you have to mute uh, your microphone. Uh, yeah, that sure. is, uh, yeah. uh, that is um, uh, that we are uh, able to rely on hardware innovation to scale our business model. If we want to uh, say to double our capabilities, uh, uh, we don't necessarily have to double the investment uh, in humans, uh, but we just have to make sure that our computational capabilities uh, double and that happens uh, just uh, by itself uh, every 14 months. And that's uh, what makes me you know, say and state that not only 21st century science, but the entire pipeline of innovation and discover uh, will be driven uh, by computational science in this case. And uh, it's not only me stating it, uh, this is you know, a very widespread uh, movement emerging, I think it's interesting uh, to, to cite uh, here um, Barron's, this is a tech uh, publication from the States uh, that uh, in April came out uh, with this uh, analysis uh, of what could be the three technologies that create a trillion dollar markets uh, over the next decades. Uh, and they listed three, uh, the other two being uh, genetic editing and the CRISPR-9 uh, technologies of splicing the genome and uh, sort of uh, rebuilding it. Uh, one is machine learning, uh, but uh, one is actually material discovery. They actually said, as you can see, uh, we are in the middle of a materials revolution because uh, we switch the process and the pipeline of material discovery uh, to the computational to the computational world, thanks to the combination of uh, computing power, algorithms that you'll see and machine learning to automate uh, much of the discovery process. And let me give you just a few examples on how relevant actually materials innovation is uh, for a society, um, from the tech uh, to really the, the, the societal. So here the first example, uh, just technology that we all carry in our pocket. This is actually the first iPhone, so it's 13 years ago. But uh, you know, all this technology is actually enabled by novel materials. Uh, that didn't exist 20, 25 years ago. And it goes from the transparent conductors of the screen that allow to you know, get away from the keyboards of the BlackBerry to the direct input to you know, polymer lithium ion batteries that last enough to support the use of the technology these days for a day or more, or a more complex, say, acoustic sound filters that allow to really achieve a very high quality of sound. And the elemental cost of this object, any smartphone that you have in your pocket, uh, is actually less than a euro, or less than a dollar. Uh, there are actually 50 cents of gold, 25 cents of tantalum, and 25 cents of all other elements. 
is actually the materials that are these elements combined with novel properties that enable this entire technology. Uh, a second example that I like very much, uh, this is the Trent uh, XWB uh, engine from Rolls-Royce. This is what you see in, say, the Airbus uh, 350. And as you all know, jet engine, you see in orange uh, the combustion chamber, uh, become more and more efficient uh, the higher the temperature of the combustion chamber. And so higher efficiency means enormous uh, saving in uh, fuel costs. And these days uh, we have uh, you know, gotten to the stage uh, where the temperature in the combustion chamber is actually 200 Celsius higher than the melting point of the super alloy blades that you see here on the right. This is actually a single crystal, carefully grown, but is actually coated in thermal barrier coatings. And the gas circulation and the thermal barrier coating make sure that you go down by those 200 Celsius as you go from the combustion chamber uh, to the blades uh, just uh, after the combustion chamber. And any improvement in the temperatures, thanks to better coatings, uh, allows us uh, to have uh, billions of uh, dollars or euros uh, saving in uh, fuel consumption. And the last one is uh, my favorite example, that is the material that has really changed the world. And uh, this is the iron-based catalyst for ammonia synthesis that Fritz Haber uh, discovered uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And that uh, this catalyst is what uh, made possible really to have systematic industrial production of ammonia um, that is the key component uh, of fertilizer. And we just wouldn't be able to feed the 7 billion people uh, today if we didn't have fertilizer. So the societal impact of this material innovation is really 1 billion life uh, saved. Okay, with this uh, sort of, you know, having tried to convince you of the widespread relevance of materials innovation from society to transportation uh, to technology, let me tell you what, uh, you know, quantum mechanical simulations uh, are able to do for you. I'll just take uh, one case that is uh, one of our own industrial cases that it's also a fun one, uh, but uh, we work a lot uh, with the watch and jewelry industry here in Switzerland and uh, what they needed were the capabilities uh, uh, to calculate uh, without any experimental input uh, the color of a new precious metal alloy uh, directly from first principles. Uh, and you see how well things work. Uh, you'll actually see this uh, very extensively in the next talk uh, from uh, Professor Baroni, but this is just to give you the flavor in a different industry, how the top three panels are our predicted colors uh, and the bottom are actually uh, the real uh, pictures uh, of the metal sample. Uh, now, what we want is not only the capability to do this uh, calculation, uh, but uh, uh, we want uh, to make this uh, directly available to the end user or uh, to make it so robust and reliable that can be run uh, systematically without supervision in high throughput screening projects uh, in which uh, we go from uh, materials, uh, say on the top, uh, that could have been uh, imported from our many databases uh, of materials uh, to a particular property, and you could think here uh, what was the reflectivity of the metal. And this is actually a real example of uh, you know, our systematic reliable workflows uh, uh, that are running uh, day in and day out. And in order to achieve this, uh, we actually had to build what I call an entire operating system uh, that uh, enables uh, the capability to run uh, thousands of calculations every hour, uh, to ingest all these calculations in databases that are fully searchable and reproducible, but also keep track of the provenance of all the data, that is, uh, uh, what was the workflow that produced. And um, as I say, you know, delivery to the end user, we work uh, on exactly building uh, this uh, robust uh, sequences of quantum mechanical simulations, these workflows that go from uh, material to property, uh, while also thinking at uh, what are the mechanisms to share this uh, within a collaboration or even uh, with the community at large. And the last element in all of this, uh, so HPC, that is very much at the root of uh, uh, the Exascale Max projects, the codes that are inside Max, uh, and the machine learning that we won't discuss too much today, but is also a key component. Machine learning is the great accelerator of all of this, because these days uh, we can actually uh, not use always systematically brute force quantum mechanical simulations, but we can use these 
uh, to train our machine learning uh, uh, algorithms uh, to be able to replicate uh, quantum mechanics uh, for a certain property at a fraction of a cost. And this comes from our uh, solid state electrolyte discovery projects uh, where machine learning uh, was accelerating uh, the screening of a single material uh, from uh, a month uh, to a minute. And uh, let me conclude uh, with a few examples of the material discovery projects uh, uh, where we work. I've already mentioned uh, batteries. This is very important, uh, both in the US, in Europe, uh, in Asia. It's uh, key not only to um, portable electronics, uh, but to transportation or really to a green economy. And uh, these days, uh, uh, we have gotten to the stage uh, where a state-of-the-art lithium-ion batteries has an energy density that is one-tenth of a bomb, but that's why they you hear all this safety announcement in, in airplanes. And so one of the greatest challenges is making batteries safer, uh, moving from the flammable liquid electrolytes between the anode and the cathode um, to very high performance, uh, fast diffusing uh, solid state uh, electrolytes. And that's what we are systematically searching with our high throughput effort. Um, effort in the world of quantum computing, uh, looking for materials that exhibit a new physics uh, that could be, say, uh, embedded uh, in the post-CMOS uh, and post-silicon computing. Uh, one possibility is our topological insulators. Uh, uh, Microsoft uh, has a huge investment in that, uh, again, for quantum computing. Uh, we have actually discovered the first uh, topological insulator that works at room temperature. And the very interesting story is that uh, uh, this is actually a mineral that was uh, discovered uh, in Brazil in 2008 uh, by an expedition of uh, crystallographers. Uh, they discovered it, uh, they published it on their journals, but of course they didn't know its property. But we ingested in our databases that contain more than a million materials, basically every inorganic material that has ever been classified, and we look into this database for novel properties and uh, we discovered that this was a uh, a topological insulator, but in particular, it's the first one that operates at a room temperature. And the last example, this was more in the world of two-dimensional materials. You probably all know graphene, uh, but uh, we did an exploration of all the possible inorganic materials that can be exfoliated uh, into two-dimensional uh, materials. Uh, and we were able to expand the portfolio uh, from the 20, 30 two-dimensional materials currently known uh, uh, to actually more than 2,000 that, again, we are uh, uh, exploring uh, for interesting properties. So let me conclude here. Uh, I think I passed the message that materials really are the enabler of the technologies uh, that sustain our economy, uh, our lives, and our society. And uh, here in Max, uh, we are actually changing the entire paradigm of materials design and discovery. Right now, with uh, simulations and first principle simulation, machine learning and data, and the future might see also neuromorphic computing and qubits. Uh, and the last a very important message is that because we pass from a, a you know, human intensive material discovery process with real life experiments to simulations, um, really the scaling of the capabilities changes and physical infrastructure ceases to be the limit of exploration. And that's one of the key reasons why I think computational science will be foundational and pervasive, not only in science, but also in technological innovation. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Nicola. Th thanks for this very interesting talk. Um, so again, questions are going to be collected during the Q&A slot. And now I think we can pass over to um, a talk by Pablo Ordejon from ICN2 Barcelona discussing how to boost the impact of the Siesta code in industry through high performance computing and high throughput computing. Pablo? So, good morning, everyone. So, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Siesta, how um, Siesta is one of the flagship uh, codes of uh, the MAX project, as uh, it was explained before by, uh, by Andrea. Uh, Siesta has a quite a broad, uh, both academic and industrial use. And what I'm going to do is to explain a bit how Max has helped in uh, developing and increasing the potential of impact for uh, for Siesta to the industry. I would like to acknowledge people from my group, uh, Miguel Puneda and uh, uh, Ahar, uh, who are students of, uh, of my institute, 
and Alberto Garcia and Vladimir Dikan from the Neighbor Institute, which is ICMAP, that have uh, also participated in MAX. And also the team of Simune. Simune is a spin-off company that we created a few years ago to uh, commercialize atomistic simulations uh, for materials uh, and services to the industry. And they have provided very valuable insight on the most common uses and requirement of, uh, of our kind of codes uh, for the industrial uh, users. So um, I'm going to start with a small, uh, a bit technical introduction about what Siesta does. Siesta is one of these codes that uh, was mentioned before by, uh, by Andrea. So it solves uh, the quantum mechanical equations of, uh, of the electrons in the system. So it simulates materials from the quantum uh, mechanics uh, of, of, of the material. Uh, and the thing that uh, um, distinguishes Siesta from other codes is the way that this numerical uh, solution of the quantum mechanical equation is done. So Siesta uses the fact that in a solid or in a molecule, the wave functions of the molecule of the solid are, uh, a, to a very good approximation, uh, uh, just combinations of the wave functions of the isolated atoms that form the solid. So you can use these approximations to expand the wave function in terms of the wave function of, of the atoms. And the advantage of these wave functions of the atoms is that they are uh, short range. They are non-zero, only very close to the atom. So you only have to uh, compute the interactions of these wave functions of one atom with the wave functions of the atoms which are very close to it. And the, uh, the consequence of that is that the matrices that you have to compute are very sparse. Most of the elements are zero, and you don't have to compute them. And the elements which are non-zero, uh, they are very easy to calculate and they can be calculated very efficiently by numerical uh, methods, just uh, adding up uh, over a few grid points uh, uh, numerically. So the consequence of that is that uh, you have matrices which uh, are very small, uh, the number of non-zeros, and you can compute them uh, essentially uh, with, a, with an effort, with a computational effort that scales only linearly with the number of atoms. And this is in contrast with most of the DFT uh, methods in which the calculation scales uh, uh, with a power, typically a power uh, of three. Uh, another advantage of this is that if you have very large uh, sections of vacuum in your system, if you are simulating a molecule or a, or a surface or a two-dimensional material, uh, vacuum is essentially free in Siesta. You don't have to put any numerical effort on that. So Siesta is especially effective and efficient when you have uh, uh, systems which are uh, not very dense. Um, and the third uh, very big uh, um, advantage of Siesta of this kind of numerical atomic orbitals is that uh, it allows you to uh, uh, look for solvers that are able to solve uh, the energy uh, for these sparse matrices, the matrices have many zeros. You can have a special uh, linear algebra for uh, sparse matrices, and they allow you to look for uh, or to use solvers which scale, uh, again, not as a cube, but uh, as a uh, lower scaling. And that's very efficient with systems which are uh, very big. Uh, the, the scaling of the calculation as a function of the number of atoms is very, very much reduced. So with Siesta, uh, with this, uh, uh, one of the things is uh, to question uh, how good is the, this kind of basis set, this atomic basis set for uh, actual calculations. And this is actually not a problem with Siesta, but it's an advantage. You can tailor, you can uh, change the quality of your basis to from doing very quick and dirty calculations with a very small basis set, with lower accuracy, but with much, much higher speed. But you can go all the way to very, very accurate calculations putting many, many orbitals per atom. Uh, but of course, that calculation would be uh, slower at the time. It all depends uh, on your problem, what level of accuracy you need to obtain to get a feasible, uh, a reasonable result for your for particular problem. With that, what you can get with Siesta is the typical things you can get with any DFT code, which is, for instance, what are the atoms uh, doing in your, in, your, in your system, in your material? How do the atoms move? What are the structures of the atoms which give you the, uh, the, the most stable uh, crystal structure or molecular structure? Uh, what are the dynamics of the atoms? What are the phonons, the vibrations, electric constants, uh, how the material transmits uh, heat, all these kind of things that have to do with dynamics of, of the atoms. And everything that has to do with what the electrons are doing. So the band structure, the charge uh, distribution of the electrons in the system, uh, you can simulate STM images, etc. So uh, all the kind of things that you can do uh, with DFT. Uh, but beyond that, Siesta has a number of things which are not so common in other DFT codes. Uh, for, for instance, you can do simulations using this hybrid 
uh, let's say, uh, multi-scale methods like quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics. You can treat part of the system with molecular mechanics, so you can treat much, much bigger systems. There is a feature of Siesta which is very important and it's not very common in other uh, codes, which is that you can uh, uh, study systems out of equilibrium. So, for instance, you can uh, study devices in which some uh, electronic current is flowing and you can see the characteristics, the electronic, the electric characteristics of the device, like looking at uh, uh, current uh, versus voltage uh, characteristics and so on. And uh, these uh, things that I showed show with the max law here are the features of Siesta which, in which Max has been really uh, instrumental. And perhaps the, the one which is most important here in this talk is the parallel, massive parallel efficiency of uh, Siesta in supercomputers, which has done mainly in the context of Max in collaboration with the people from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center who are also a partner in, in Max. So let me show you an example of how uh, uh, this efficiency uh, is, is going in Siesta. So these are systems which are really very, very large systems. This is a uh, just a fraction of a DNA strand. Our calculation, the DNA strand was very long. It has uh, had 17,000 atoms. Or another system was a, 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 a stacking of a graphene on top of a boron nitride uh, two-dimensional layer uh, that had uh, about 13,000 atoms. These are very, very big systems for quantum mechanical calculations. And this is a typical scaling we have with one of the solvers I was mentioning. This is a sub-cubic uh, uh, solver, essentially linear scaling solver. And this is the scaling we have uh, of the CPU time versus the number of processors for this DNA chain and for the uh, bidimensional uh, stack. So you see that the scaling versus number of processors is really very good. And the CPU time that you need uh, for a particular uh, calculation is really manageable in this kind of uh, supercomputers. So this is uh, something that came out of, of Max and this is very important for the performance of, of these codes. Also, uh, Siesta in the, in the, in the past has had uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, industrial impact. This is just a, a, a slide showing five collaborations in which my group uh, has done with, uh, with uh, industrial companies. We started with Motorola uh, about 15 years ago, and at that time they were looking at highly electric thin films, and they, they used Siesta to, to study some of, their, uh, of the materials, and actually they filed a, a few patents uh, based on the calculations from Siesta. With Sumitamo Chemical, we have had also a very long collaboration and we use it for many projects, essentially, uh, I think, for, for polymers. With Air Products and Chemicals uh, from uh, Allentown in the US and a subsidiary of it uh, here in Spain, in Barcelona, Carburos Metallicos. Um, they were looking at different kind of properties. One of them was similar to the one in Motorola, but in this particular case with uh, the position of metallic thin films for electronic uh, intercorrects in circuits. And another project was based on more in the uh, energy side, uh, looking for materials for hydrogen storage. And two projects we have uh, tackled within Max, one was uh, shown initially by, uh, by Andrea in his presentation, was a project with Avengoa, where they were looking at uh, nanofluids for thermal storage. And we use uh, our codes uh, in this particular project to demonstrate um, the way that we could uh, solve uh, these, 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 these materials. And this is a project we are uh, uh, working on right now in the current Max. It's a company, it's a, uh, a small uh, company here in the Barcelona area that uh, develops uh, oxygen sensing devices, and we are helping them to understand the physics of the material and to improve the quality of the material for uh, oxygen sensing. So I, as I did in my presentation, in my initial slide, I wanted to mention things that we are doing with uh, Simunes. Simunes, this is been a company we created a few years ago, actually before the starting of Max. And Simune provides computer simulation services, and in particular, atomistic simulation, among other things. The clients are typically companies developing innovative and cutting edge technologies based on advanced material properties. And the idea is to use simulation to improve uh, the material properties and to um, speed up the, the development cycle. The value proposition of Simune is essentially threefold. One is translation, is to translate the problem which the industry has into a simulation problem. The second one is to reduce the barrier for adoption, to provide tools so that the company can start doing calculations uh, easily, or, or even to the, the, do the calculations by themselves in, the, in, in Simune, and to facilitate the usage, uh, putting up tools and, uh, and uh, things which allow you to use the codes without the burden of having to learn all the, the guts of the code, which is very important for the industry. So Simune has, uh, is in the middle of between the industry and the academy, has a very strong link with the academy, and actually is a spin-off of our institutes. 
So it has very strong uh, interaction with ICN2 and with uh, Sigrid and Ogune in San Sebastian, where it's actually located. But it has also uh, development uh, projects and collaboration projects with MIT and other academic institutions. It's one of the participants in the development of Siesta, but also in other initiatives like the Electronic Structure Library from CICAM. And it has an agreement also with Max to explore common, common interest. But in the most industrial side, this is where the main team, uh, Simune uh, team uh, works. I would like to uh, explain a bit this collaboration with JSOL that was uh, also mentioned by, uh, by Andrea in the beginning. JSOL is a, a, a Japanese company that has a code which is called JOCTA, which is an integrated simulation package uh, of software for polymeric materials, which is multi-scale. It has many, many modules uh, to solve different parts of the, of the problem from very small scales, which is atomic scale to the micrometer scale. And Siesta was adopted by uh, JSOL or by JOCTA as the atomistic uh, modeling, quantum mechanics uh, modeling package that they use in their code. So there was a quite big effort of, of Simune to uh, adapt a, a Siesta to the JOCTA uh, uh, software, and this is something that is already uh, going on. So let me finish just with a, a, a list of things we have learned from our MAX activities, and in particular, the industrial observatory activities we had in the first MAX project, and also from the activity of Simune in interacting with the industry. One thing, and, and some of this uh, will be uh, explained later again by uh, by Kotar. Uh, so uh, one of the things is that the software has, has really to be ready to use, ready to go, easy to use and service. The companies, the industry will not use something which is not very easy to use and service. Uh, something which is uh, very um, uh, interesting is on-demand services and software as a service, so providing services to the companies that uh, they can use. Uh, something which industry demands very, very often is uh, user interfaces, graphical interfaces and interfaces easy to use, not the typical ones that we use in the academic environment. And they need workflows. They, the problems they want to solve are not energies or geometries. They are complex problems and they need workflows to automate the calculations of their properties and, the, and the, to solve the problems. This is something that uh, within the AIDA uh, part of uh, Maxi, we are, we are also working on. There is a need for automation, handling the simulation, run results, and so on. And this is something that also AIDA handles. Uh, so far, the companies have been more interested in high throughput computer rather than high performance computer. But I think time to solution is critical and high performance computer may become essential in the near future, even for small problems. Something which is also very important is the possibility of doing multi-scale and multi-physics. Just doing a initial or first principles is not going to be enough for the industry. And also the integration of Fabinicio and industrial growth flows will become, I think, a reality. I show you JSOL, but there are other examples in which uh, some of us are involved, and Nicola Massari and myself, uh, which is, for instance, the Intersect uh, European Union project, in which these ideas are putting into, into place. And with this, I will finish, and I will ask for your, uh, wait for your questions in the question and answer section. So thank you. OK, thanks a lot, Pablo. Th thanks for this very nice talk. So I think we are a bit ahead of time, but um, we now have the question and answer. So I'll, I'll try to uh, take as many as possible. Uh, in the chat, I've seen there's a, a question by Nilesh Gupta, and perhaps we can start from here. Uh, how uh, the materials melting can be increased by materials engineer? Just for the sake of time, I read it. Uh, uh, directly. And perhaps uh, may I ask uh, Nicola Marzari to, to pick on this question. Okay, sure, with, uh, with, uh, with pleasure. And uh, I think this is a very good example of, uh, you know, what is a very important problem in many areas. You know, I made the example of the aero industry, but it could be, you know, as simple as uh, looking at uh, something uh, that is embedded into our uh, ICT silicon uh, platform. And also one uh, where uh, we need uh, the knowledge also of the domain expert. Uh, this is you know, what we do as material scientists. Uh, we translate uh, an industrial problem uh, into a material question uh, that can be answered by simulation. And in this translation, uh, uh, you know, one has to go from the general to the particular. That is, there are, uh, you know, infinite classes of materials and there are uh, many strategies that one can use uh, uh, to actually try to engineer those materials. And there are also times uh, where we cannot do better 
and the, the jet uh, engines are a very good example. You know, those are nickel super alloys. Uh, we would like uh, to increase the melting temperature and sort of intuitively increasing the melting temperature uh, means making the material more stiff, uh, that is uh, more uh, actually resilient uh, to not melt uh, upon all the thermal displacements that are induced by temperature. Uh, but often make it more stiff uh, means also make it uh, more brittle and so more sensitive to cracks uh, and uh, to stress corrosion cracking. And so, you know, actually right now there is uh, no good strategy to improve the melting temperature of the nickel superalloys. And so rather than increase the melting temperature there, uh, what one does uh, is coat this uh, with materials that are able to block the heat uh, to reach uh, the, 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 the blazing time to melt. But of course, there could be completely different cases uh, where you want uh, to increase the melting temperature. And as I said, that those are material specific. Uh, say, if you are in an inorganic materials, uh, this could involve uh, alloying uh, with a different element uh, that brings a compound that overall uh, has a, a high melting temperature. If you're dealing with a polymer or a polymer blender, you might want uh, to introduce chemical groups that build uh, bridges. And you know this is, after all, what is done in the vulcanization process of rubber. Uh, but in general, there is not a, a single strategy. So it's a general problem uh, that has to be solved uh, with different approaches from class of material to class of material. And that's where uh, the domain expert, the material scientists come in that are able to translate uh, the problem into a question. And that's why uh, in the last slide of Andrea's, uh, you know, what Max can do for you, there was also the comment uh, about uh, consulting uh, because it's not only doing brute force simulations, but it's really do the right simulations that answer the right question. Okay, thanks a lot, Nicola. Uh, there's a second question. So there are more questions uh, uh, coming from uh, uh, previous days. I, I just like to pick one that is, uh, uh, can the code supported by Max run on a small cluster with GPUs? And uh, as I partly said during my presentation, yes, uh, the Max codes, uh, basically, basically most of them already run on uh, GPUs accelerated systems, both uh, in the high-end uh, uh, supercomputing centers, but also on uh, small cluster. And actually under my desk, I have a small workstation with two GPUs uh, and I'm profitably able to run uh, routinely, getting speed up compared to, I don't know, 16 MPI tasks of the order of uh, factor 5, 8, 10. Uh, on these two cards. So the answer is definitely yes. I think this is uh, quite relevant since this disruptive uh, the technology is already there, is already in place. So for the sake of time, since uh, we're uh, a bit behind schedule, I'd suggest now that uh, we'll uh, uh, pick on next uh, the remaining questions during the second time slot and I'll pass directly the mic to Stefano Baroni from uh, CISA Trieste uh, uh, that will talk about quantum mechanics uh, on the supermarket shelf. Stefano, Mike, stage is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Stefano Baroni speaking uh, from uh, uh, Trieste in the northeast of Italy, on the top uh, northernmost uh, uh, spot of the Adriatic Sea. Beautiful weather today. So today uh, I'm going to uh, tell you uh, a story, actually it's uh, the story of uh, what is probably the most su successful uh, uh, project of industrial research ever carried out uh, uh, at CISA in my, my place, my university. Uh, it's about uh, the prediction of uh, the color optical properties uh, of natural dyes. And uh, quite significantly, this project was carried out uh, not uh, in a chemistry department, but in a theoretical physics group. Uh, leveraging uh, the competencies in molecular simulations uh, and high-performance computing uh, that are strong in this place. 
And uh, all this project has been uh, made possible by the, the synergies created by the Max Center of Excellence for uh, supercomputing applications between uh, theoretical physicists, chemists, material scientists, and IT technologists uh, and uh, engineers. So, uh, the uh, market of natural dyes in uh, uh, the food industry is uh, a multi billion uh, global market that is uh, steadily increasing in size basically because of the increasing global pressure from customers and lawmakers who demand a shift towards ingredients and additives that are perceived as more natural and healthier. The story, uh, so the uh, natural dyes in order uh, uh, to go to the market have to fulfill uh, a few basic uh, and uh, obvious requirements they have to be tunable that is you have to be able to adjust uh, uh, the hue of uh, uh, the colorant that you are going to employ in your uh, uh, products they have to be stable you want uh, uh, your products to uh, uh, stay on the supermarket shelves uh, uh, for a long enough, enough period of course, so they have to be safe. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, they have to be inexpensive. So the story uh, I'm going uh, to tell you today has started in a way in uh, the early 2000s uh, by a research funded by uh, the UK uh, Food Standard Administration. Uh, who said, uh, which suggested that the consumption of certain mixtures of artificial food colors and preservatives could be linked to attention deficit and increased hyperactivity in some children. Uh, a few, uh, a few uh, artificial dyes common uh, in food products were targeted and uh, six uh, uh, of them were identified and uh, nicknamed uh, the Southampton Six uh, after uh, the place where uh, the research was carried out. And because of this, in 2010, a, 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 a European-wide uh, compulsory uh, warning must be put uh, on any food and drink product that contains any of these colors and uh, a warning uh, uh, has to be put according to which this product may have adverse effect uh, on activity and attention in uh, children. Because, uh, of course, uh, in, uh, uh, in the food industry, um, producers need uh, a broad palette of, uh, of colors Many of them uh, are easy to find in nature, basically greens, uh, yellows, uh, uh, orange, and uh, purple are uh, common uh, in uh, fruits uh, and uh, vegetables. Uh, blues are very rare. And uh, as uh, uh, green and uh, orange yellow uh, colors, are expressed mainly by chlorophylls in the first place and the carotenoid and curcuminoid in the second case. Uh, all the gamut from red to purple passing through blue is expressed by flavonoids, of which uh, the main uh, uh, subfamily is, uh, uh, is the family of uh, anthocyanins. Uh, this uh, research, uh, the research I'm going uh, to tell you about, was uh, co-funded uh, uh, by uh, Mars Chocolate, who were seeking for uh, replacements of uh, blue for their uh, M&M's uh, uh, candies. Uh, blue, as uh, we were noticing before, is not a particularly common uh, uh, color in nature. 
and uh, that's why uh, identifying uh, the right uh, uh, molecule uh, uh, is a challenge is a challenge for uh, uh, for the food industry so anthocyanins are a family of uh, uh, molecules made by uh, a double aromatic ring linked by uh, single or double uh, bonds to a single uh, um, phenyl ring, a single aromatic ring, and according to which uh, uh, chemical is attached to each of these uh, uh, termination points, the uh, uh, the anthocyanin, the molecule, expresses different uh, colors. Uh, there are indeed a few flowers that are uh, uh, blue in nature. Uh, not by chance, uh, anthocyanins have this name. The name goes after the Greek anthos, which means flower, and kyanos, so that means uh, blue. Unfortunately, uh, the pigments from, uh, from flowers are uh, expensive to extract and not very stable, so that alternatives uh, have to be uh, found. So irrational design of anthocyanins is hindered by mainly uh, two uh, uh, factors that are both related to stability. Anthocyanins uh, rot easily, so they, uh, they degrade uh, very easily. And uh, by the same token, uh, uh, they are highly reactive, so that they are very uh, difficult to, uh, uh, to stabilize in, uh, uh, in the laboratory. Uh, above all, very little uh, is known of the microscopic mechanisms that determine the stability and chromatic properties of anthocyanins and uh, the relation between structure and color. And here is uh, where uh, theory uh, comes uh, into play. Before uh, um, showing you one important result that uh, we have achieved, let me just uh, summarize. Uh, what we call color. The color of an object uh, is uh, the combination of three factors. The first is the quality of uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, light that shines uh, on the object. The, uh, the, third, the second factor is how much of uh, the impinging, uh, uh, the impinging uh, light, uh, which usually comes from uh, natural sources from the sun uh, is absorbed or transmitted by uh, the sample. And the third, there is a, a, neuro, a neurophysiological uh, processing of uh, the light transmitted from the sample uh, to the eye and, uh, and the brain. What do we uh, material scientists are uh, uh, able uh, to predict is uh, uh, there's uh, uh, absorption coefficient that uh, we wanted to predict uh, given the chemical composition of the chemical uh, as uh, the only input. So the chemical composition of a dye determines uh, the molecular structure in the first place. And uh, the molecular structure, of course, is affected by environmental conditions such as acidity uh, of the solution or the presence uh, of copigments in the solution. Uh, the combination uh, of uh, 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 chemical uh, conditions and environmental conditions through the molecular structure give rise to the electronic structure that eventually uh, reflects onto the absorption spectrum that is uh, the final goal of our research. And from this, uh, from standard uh, uh, neurophysiological models, we can uh, deduce uh, the uh, color perceived by, uh, 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 by looking at the objects. All this uh, uh, has to be implemented uh, in a complex uh, uh, multi-scale uh, protocol uh, whose ingredients I'm not going to uh, describe, but that are based on fundamental science. They are based on uh, concepts from uh, statistical mechanics, chemistry, and uh, uh, quantum mechanics. All this was uh, implemented uh, in uh, 
the quantum espresso suit of uh, computer codes that uh, have, uh, as you have uh, heard, is one uh, of uh, uh, the flagship codes uh, maintained, upgraded, uh, and uh, distributed by the Max Center of Excellence. So this is uh, the, uh, an example of the kind of results that we can uh, obtain. This is the structure of uh, 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 cyanin, the most common uh, uh, anthocyanin present, uh, for instance, uh, in, uh, in blueberries. Uh, the color is not particularly blue, uh, as most of the colors found in nature is more a shade uh, of, uh, of purple. Uh, what is good in these uh, molecules uh, is that they are naturally functionalized. So you can find them in nature in uh, structures where one of these terminations is uh, uh, substituted by a complex molecule such as another sugar or some uh, uh, synaptic acids or other auxiliary chemicals. So the challenge is how to identify the proper functionalization that uh, produces the right shade of color. And this was uh, achieved by molecular simulations we were able to identify the right substituent that would turn this purple into blue. I'm not able to disclose the chemical identity of uh, this molecule because uh, a patent is pending on, uh, on this molecule, but uh, you can see that uh, uh, you can achieve uh, two important goals. The molecule is more stable than pristine cyanin, because it is stable at uh, not only at alkaline uh, conditions, uh, at uh, uh, alkaline pHs, but also in moderately, uh, in moderately acidic conditions, which pristine uh, cyanin is not, and it has uh, the right shade of uh, color that goes under the uh, industrial name of blue two. So this is uh, the end of the story. Uh, in uh, the next uh, two or three years, uh, when you buy uh, uh, M&M uh, uh, candies on the supermarket shel uh, shelf, you will find uh, inside uh, quantum mechanics. You will know that it has been uh, produced uh, by quantum espresso, uh, thanks uh, to the uh, powerful support of Max, and last but not least, uh, the Quantum Espresso Foundation, that is a private company that fosters the uh, development and the maintenance of quantum espresso and uh, the interaction with industrial partners. Uh, These uh, uh, slides can be, uh, can be downloaded if so you wish at this uh, uh, URL, at this uh, website. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Stefano. Really looking forward to find these candies at the, at the supermarket. Uh, no, thanks a lot, very inspiring. And uh, so uh, uh, I, I will switch quickly to next presentation that is uh, by uh, Carlo Cavazzoni uh, from Cineca Bologna concerning HPC services for industry and uh, SMEs the European's perspective on uh, HPC. Okay. Um, Hi, Carlo. Yes. Okay. Hi. So, uh, my, my presentation will be probably much less exciting than the presentation you have seen before, but it's, uh, I think, important to understand, uh, to understand uh, uh, which is uh, the effort and what is going on at the European level and what are the possibility to actual uh, participate and take advantage of the ecosystem is going to is is being implemented uh, thanks to the support of the European Commission and now uh, thanks to the support of uh, Euro HPC uh, joint undertaking uh, uh, that is taking over the European uh, let's say broader European Commission initiative to support and being more focalized to to the um, exploitation and the effectiveness of uh, HPC um, technologies. So Euro HPC, 
which has said is a joint undertaking where uh, most of the European uh, 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 most of the European countries participate uh, is uh, uh, an organization that uh, have been created to be more focused and so more effective uh, to uh, with respect to the previous let's say framework program uh to to support uh, um, hpc exploitation so um this is uh, this uh, uh, um, joint undertaking essentially uh, is based on two pillar one of the pillar is infrastructure so machines actually machines and the other one is research and innovation both at the level of uh, uh hardware so the, the research and innovation in hardware, so like uh, developing a European uh, processor and software like the COEs. So COEs are among uh, the, um, the uh, research and innovation initiatives supported by EuroHPC. So actually now the infrastructure is uh, being uh, the first uh, um, pillar to be active uh, for which uh, already three procurement of pre exascale machine is going to be run, uh, to be launched uh, in October, and uh, one of these one of these three machine that whose size is to, is comparable to the top three machine uh, we have now in the world. One will be located in uh, Italy, one in Spain, and one in uh, uh, Finland. They will be uh, machine available for research, but also for industry as we will see in a, in a moment. So uh, this is uh, probably we can skip since we are we have no, do not, not much time. As I said, so uh, your HPC uh, has two pillars uh, concerning the, the funding models. So one for the infrastructure, one for the research, but as is based on an ecosystem with three pillars. <laughs> Uh, this is a little bit confusing, but uh, from one side you have uh, the model for the funding and this side you have the stakeholder of the initiative. So three pillar of stakeholders. The three stakeholders are infrastructure, so supercomputing center that uh, also are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, working together uh, in a network of supercomputer which is represented by PRACE. Um, that is the actual subject that uh, where you can apply for uh, receiving a CPU time on the machine. Then there is the technologies. So the stakeholder concerning the production of machines uh, and tomorrow of also processors that or accelerator that can can be implemented into real machine. And the, in the other side there are the third stakeholder which is. Uh, uh, application and in this case, uh, uh, center of excellence plus a number of initiatives more concerning transversal um, research and innovation action, more on tools, software engineering, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, especially uh, because we are speaking about industry. Uh, Europe has also promoted the, the um, setup of a European, uh, let's say, association of industry uh, whose business is uh, uh, in the HPC space or market. So this association started uh, with uh, mainly industry providing hardware and uh, research lab uh, providing. Uh, uh, research on architecture, but actually it is expanding to, uh, let's say, industry for, for uh, that were typically customer or, uh, let's say, user of HPC technology, because now for their business, for many of these industry, HPC or IT technology is becoming so relevant that they are willing to enter this association in order to, let's say, uh, have a voice and uh, condition the future plan for investment in Europe because the, one of the mission is to help HPC or at, uh, Euro HPC uh, today and yesterday uh, European Commission to shape uh, the investment and the plan 
for, uh, for the future. So now for Euro HPC for industry, now we, in the last two slides, we, we come to practical uh, things. So it has been said, uh, and it has been defined actually that up to 20% of the CPU time of the pre exascale and petascale co-funded system can be sold to industry. So this is a huge amount of uh, CPU time. 20% of three pre exascale is almost pre exascale per se. So it's a huge amount of time that is available for those that, would, that have the problem and can be accessed uh, simply by, uh, let's say, as a cloud service, let to say, to simplify. This will happen in uh, one and a half year from now because the machine is being procured, procured right now. So the European industry will have access to facility which are leading edge and uh, to a size which is not less than today topmost supercomputing in the world. Then uh, European Competence Center is another uh, initiatives that have been uh, uh, that will be funded uh, within the Euro HPC program, and it is a network of national center that uh, mainly targeting uh, and uh, the inclusion of new uh, industry, especially small medium enterprise. Uh, helping them to take up with uh, HPC technology. So they will provide, uh, so these are, they are under definition. So the detail are not yet uh, uh, being defined, but in general, uh, what we are discussing that this competence center provide training, brokering of resources and consulting mainly for, uh, for uh, especially small medium enterprises or those that have to enter into the market of HPC. Then there is another initiative which has already been funded in the past uh, Horizon program, which is called Fortissimo. In the past, this initiative that was de dedicated to fund uh, proof of concept uh, mainly, industrial proof of concept, whose size is, was in the order of 100, 200,000 euro, um, it was mainly dedicated to, to use HPC technology to accelerate or uh, increase the yield of production in industry. Now, what is said in the Euro, uh, Euro HPC is that this will be shifted more to our design and the engineering uh, inside department inside industry. So instead of, let's say, accelerating the production and the improving the yield of production, uh, now, uh, in the new Fortissimo co in the new Fortissimo project that will be say launched next year, uh, the engineering so especially in the area of center of excellence could be funded. So in in our case, if you have a good idea and a proof of concept in mind uh, for which you need a supercomputing center, the support of a max partner and uh, you as a and industry user, you can apply, you can ask for support to do this uh, proof of concept. And this initiative can be found up to 200 kilo euro for 12 months in order to support you taking up the HPC technology. So finally, what the high performance computing center can do within a center of excellence like Max. So you have heard uh, the support and the consultants, the cons consulting uh, service you can uh, have from, uh, from a scientist. Uh, instead, from a computer, for computer center, you can have support in using uh, the COE software, especially on uh, Euro HP, European HPC systems, consulting how to optimize the HPC system usage, because there are many parameters to tune and tweak in order to get the the maximum performance and so the maximum saving in terms of money uh, when you run in HPC system. Then you can have tr help for troubleshooting, so to solve a problem that are blocking you from using uh, the code or the supercomputer or the model. Then you can have a personalized training, so some uh, specific training we can set up uh, in order to help you in taking up uh, with the technology. And finally, obviously, we have a PC resources for which up to 20% uh, in a uh, in few months we can able to 
sell uh, to, to third the party out of the system we have in Europe, we will have in Europe. Thank you. I'm over. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Carlos. Sorry, I, I was uh, late in unmuting. And uh, thanks also for reporting this. Uh, that I would say are very good news for uh, industrial users. Again, since we are a bit uh, behind schedule, I'll uh, pass quickly to the uh, last talk of today's session, that is by Dr. Gerard Goldbeck from EMMC. Uh, increasing the impact of materials modeling in industry, the contribution of EMMC. Uh, Gerard? Okay, hello uh, and uh, good, good, uh, good, good morning everyone. Uh, so, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a brief overview over the work um, uh, of the European Materials Modeling Council, EMMC, uh, in which my company, Goldberg Consulting, has been a partner. And also, I'm now the executive secretary of a newfound association, which is really for uh, industry and for all of the modeling stakeholders to have a voice. Uh, I'll come back to that later. So, um, so the European Materials Modeling Council is there really to uh, represent all stakeholders of modeling, uh, modelers, software owners, software companies, uh, translators, consultants, and of course, end users in industry. And also importantly, it covers all types of modeling. So from electronic structure modeling uh, to continuum modeling, molecules, materials, processes, manufacturing. And currently uh, on emmc.info, we have uh, about 1000 uh, registered members. The uh, EMMC came to life really in 2014 by a group of people that got together uh, to start this in, as an initiative and then in 2016 got funding from the European Commission under Horizon 2020 and that funding enabled us to really do um, you know build this whole uh, ecosystem you know with participation from many different uh, organizations including also for example EPFL Nicola uh, has been also very important here. But the funding has now come to an end um, and I will report a little bit on the, the things that we have done and on the future. So the focus areas have been to go from the uh, development of models themselves uh, to how they can be applied and how that can be transferred. And obviously today has been very much also about that showing how high performance computing, for example, how consulting, how working with industry and so on can really transform the field. And the areas that the MMC has been focusing on, apart from the, the model development themselves, which by the way, we will publish a roadmap on that very shortly, uh, has been on interoperability and integration, professional software deployment, translation and training, and uh, repositories and marketplaces, and, and uh, how that affects the industry. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk in turn about um, uh, some of these aspects. So first, um, in, interoperability, so with meaning the correct and meaningful communication and integration amongst uh, intelligent agents is of course key to um, industrial impact. We heard that, um, for example, industry you know requires workflows. Uh, we, we saw what AIDA and so on can do to implement these types of workflows, and we have to come to a way of representing uh, modeling and the data from modeling in a more coherent way. And this is uh, where some of the work has been taking place also in the EMMC um, by um, working on a standardized terminology. And I invite you to, to have a look at this SEN workshop agreement, CWA uh, 17284. And this is about uh, a terminology and classification that again, includes all types of modeling. And also then a standardized doc documentation for a simulation, which will be more and more important as we make data fair. So not only findable, uh, accessible, but also interoperable and reusable. So the meaning of the data is very important. And what I can't talk go into today is um, an ontology that 
has been developed within the EMMC and with very wide consultation, which really supports um, uh, th this effort. So the question is, you know, what we produce a lot of data, and also when we talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, it needs a lot of data. Modeling can provide these data. High-performance computer computing can provide it, but we need to know what those data mean uh, by shared semantics. And that supports overall digitalization efforts of industry as well. Um, so here is just a reference. Um, the uh, MO has recently been published uh, under Creative Commons uh, license on, on GitHub. There's a repository of the ontology and of training and of um, Python tools to work with it as well. And also um, that we've got a number of um, talks and webinars recorded about that. Um, then a little bit about software. We've also been working quite a lot in guides for you know software development uh, that make it more sustainable and also more recently here a guide to find the right business model for materials modeling software. So you've developed some software you know how can that be brought to industrial use. Um, here's a bit of an overview of the market size. We're still in the position that all of the discrete modeling is a much smaller market than the continuum modeling. And obviously with more and more use of HPC, the importance of that field will, will increase. And we need to do it in the right way. Looking at um, you know, the software being robust and so on, having very clear ownership and licensing conditions. Ownership is very important from the beginning. Uh, and look at the markets but also keep in mind all of the things that are happening. We've heard this already, multi-scale, multi-physics, um, the interoperability um, and the new architectures, even all the way to quantum computing, which is where quantum chemistry, for example, is one of the first applications of this new technology. Um, interfaces are evolving and the way in which software is accessed is really evolving more towards cloud-based um, solutions and uh, there's also initiatives that I mentioned briefly later, digital marketplaces where EMMC is also very strongly involved to, to make it much more agile and much more available to everyone. Um, and then when it comes to industrial use, we have to think about, um, you know, how can someone in industry now make a case, make the business case to use it and where is really the impact of modeling? A really nice framework is here in the middle called QBTM, Quantitative Benchmark Time, Time to Market Framework, which was from the Materials Genome Initiative in the US that looks at the design, development, manufacturing, and deployment stages of a, of a materials process. There's a, I, uh, you can also find online very nice examples, for example, from the Corning Gorilla Glass uh, development which is on, the, on all of the sort of mobile phones uh, to make them more scratch resistant and how modeling helped to support a really accelerated development of the version three of that glass in only 22 months through all of the four stages. And uh, we've analyzed how now all of the four dimensions uh, of people, tools, process, and data can feed into and be analyzed where they make a difference uh, to lead to higher efficiency and effectiveness. So this is all published in a white paper that is just about to be released by the EMMC to help industry internally to get to what we call a higher maturity level. Um, so a lot of impact is achieved by individual cases but it needs to be, become much more managed and even optimized and therefore much more repeatable uh, and on a larger scale. Um, so, um, so that's the, some of the recommendations from that white paper to, to look at all of the dimensions, not, not just the hardware, not just the software, not just the individual, uh, the processes, the data, everything needs to be integrated and really uh, analyzed for effectiveness and the be benefits that can be achieved from that. Um, that is not to say that case studies is not in, are not important and uh, you will find on EMMC a number of case studies that really report um, on in industrial applications including in all of them uh, the investments that were made and also the impacts that were actually uh, obtained from, from materials modeling 
in these uh, different companies um, and also some academic uh, institutions. So the future uh, is about uh, much stronger integration um, for interoperability for semantics uh, foundations to enable machine learning, to enable digitalization, to enable interoperable software. Um, and um, marketplaces are one system that is going to benefit from that and going to utilize these um, advances to deploy all of the different types of softwares um, and, and models to really um, speed up the, um, the time it takes uh, at the moment from some really fantastic academic development or from a better hardware development to reach the end user. So there are two uh, projects called Marketplace and VIMP, uh, Virtual Materials Marketplace, which are ongoing to actually develop um, digital materials modeling marketplaces and turn them into sustainable long-term efforts. And then, you know, integration uh, for industry is important um, at all business levels. Um, so understanding where modeling impacts individual tasks, activities, but also all the way into business decisions at a, at a higher level. We're aiming to support that uh, going further in the future within an association that we founded in July this year, just um, a couple of months ago in Brussels. Uh, and the aim is really to support modeling and the digitalization of materials and in all of its stakeholders and coordinate efforts and to support the, the sustainability of modeling uh, and the software industry that is in, in Europe. And here are the, the directors um, that are, um, managed to you know, commit at, the, at that time of starting the association uh, and we will obviously gaining members now and we'll have, um, you know, a general meeting in 2020 with uh, further elections and, 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 and so on. So hopefully we, you will all be able to support um, this initiative and I would like to acknowledge my co-author on this presentation, Alex Simpeler. And of course, the funding we received for the EMMC from the European Union. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Carol. Thanks a lot for the for for, for the talk. So uh, I think now we have reached the second uh, question and answer slot, and uh, uh, I see uh, there have been a number of uh, uh, questions from the audience. So perhaps we can. Uh, uh, start from them. Uh, I see there are a couple of questions from uh, uh, Marco Di Gennaro, so I'll try to uh, unmute Marco just to have him uh, uh, directly asking the questions. Hi Marco, uh, can you hear us? Okay, so there may be uh, troubles uh, with the, yeah, uh, it seems there are troubles, so let me read the questions myself. Uh, so first question is, is Max considering the possibility of using quantum computers for materials design in a few decades? Uh, hello? So I think that uh, this is not yet within the work plan of Max. Surely is in uh, a number of roadmaps and there are a number of people looking at this issue. Uh, my personal understanding is that um, what is foreseen is to have an interface between classical and quantum computers. And if you are able to cast uh, some of your uh, classical algorithm in a form that could be worked out by, by a quantum, computer, then you can see quantum computers as accelerators or uh, 2.0 version of accelerators. I think that uh, Carlo Cavazzoni uh, may also pick on this question or Nicola Martari or anyone else among the panelists.
Carlo? Well, yes. Uh, so let me let me recap uh, if I properly understand. So the the question is uh, uh, the the role of quantum computer, right? Yeah. Uh, is is Max yeah. considering the possibility yeah. of using so, quantum computers for materials? So let, let me. Well, let me let me uh, first uh, uh, give a few uh, information about uh, uh, the the possible evolution of quantum computer, regardless if this will uh, ever happen or not. So this is uh, still an open question. But I'm pretty sure that as soon as there will be something uh, on the market that can be sold on the market, we will be targeted by the vendors in order to to buy one of them. So yes, the, 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 the answer is yes, as soon there will be uh, some quantum computer on the market to be used, uh, it will be considered to be integrated with the standard, let's say digital computer. This will never disappear soon uh, because uh, a quantum computer, to run a quantum computer, you need a lot of digital equipment around, first of all. Second, this can be seen as more as an accelerator of today, so a super accelerator, something that, let's say, can manage a specific kernel, but it for sure it cannot manage all the complexity in the software uh, of a modern uh, material science application. So um, it will not happen in the next, I think, in the next 10 years, unless for uh, proof of concept or, or very, or research lab kind of, um uh yes uh activities okay thanks carlo anyone else uh, willing to uh, to further comment on this issue i guess this is uh, nicola marzari so it's probably not a matter of decades uh, i think uh, we'll know much sooner if there are going to be viable quantum computers uh, it's a completely open question, as uh, Carlo mentioned. Uh, the big companies uh, like uh, Microsoft, uh, Google, IBM are investing uh, heavily in it, uh, but not so much because they believe uh, this is the future of computing, but because they realize uh, that uh, you know it could be uh, the largest threat they face to their business model. So if uh, you know. A uh, real quantum computer is deployed, uh, then they need to be the first to do it, and that's why they are investing a billion of dollars in this. Uh, but uh, I think the answer is still uh, very far away uh, beyond the demonstrators. So, you know, getting to the capabilities uh, and the multi-purpose uh, um, approach of current uh, classical computing. But of course, if it could be done, uh, it uh, it would be a game changer. Okay, thanks, Nicola. Uh, I'll go quickly to another question, still, still from Marco Di Gennaro. Are Max code tested uh, on machines other than Max ones? Uh, how do quantum expression siesta perform, for example, on Amazon or uh, Azure? Uh, let me first start the answer. That is that uh, uh, first. Uh, Yes, Max code are not uh, only targeted to Max uh, architectures represented within the Max partnership. So surely we are going to look at architectures that are outside uh, Max partnership, and also, most importantly, not only high-end supercomputers, but also commodity clusters, uh, workstations. This is already the case, and that has to be and will stay the the same. Uh, second piece of information is that already. Quantum Espresso, quantum espresso tutorials, uh, for instance, uh, and AIDA tutorials, uh, we've already been using Amazon machines, uh, so uh, the codes work there. Uh, though, uh, I mean, uh, surely you cannot exploit a, a large scale parallelism on these machines now. So uh, perhaps uh, um, Pablo de Hon may uh, want to comment about Siesta performance or again, Nicola Marzari, since uh, uh, this experience with Quantum Espresso was done within the AIDA tutorials, or anyone else again. Yeah, so this is Pablo. Um, in, in the case of Siesta, is what um, Andrea said. Actually, Siesta was built for um, initially for standard workstations and even um, desktop uh, machines, and it evolved 
towards uh, high performance computing environments. So it's actually a code that is mainly used uh, not in high performance computing environments, but on small workstations or, or clusters. So it's, it's really very much optimized there. And uh, concerning these uh, platforms of uh, computing platforms like Amazon and so on, Siesta is uh, it, it's uh, set up to, to use Docker. So we have a Docker distribution of Siesta that you can deploy in this kind of architectures. But as um, Andrea was saying, it's, th th these machines are still not very efficient in parallel. And uh, actually the cost of usage is, is quite high uh, in, 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 at, at this moment. But, but yes, you, you, you can use it in this kind of environments. Okay, thanks a lot, Pablo. Sure. Any other comments on the subject? Uh, Carlo from Cineca. Uh, the model is clearly there. There is a booming, booming market uh, to deploy application as a service on the cloud, and uh, Nvidia it will be another subject that uh, will provide uh, by its own or through Amazon machine where you can run. Uh, code at the maximum possible available performance, even more than in supercomputing center, because they maybe can provide a specific uh, hardware. But the problem is the cost. So this is highly competitive kind of resources. So in the cloud, you, you may find it. You may find it tomorrow, even in parallel instances. But then uh, uh, it's not uh, for grant, it's for pay. So. Uh, the cost will not be so the pre, the performance will be proportional to the or the cost will be proportional to the performance not a matter of if they perform they perform even they can perform even better but then uh, you have to pay for them so it will be a paper usage and paper performance model okay thanks yeah. carlo so maybe i i have also a comment nicola so yeah the value reiterating what carlo has said is that the cloud allows us to offer services that is uh, you know that's the only way by which uh, uh, we can uh, you know basically deliver services uh, to an industrial user or uh, we can have uh, for uh, you know an arbitrary amount of time uh, uh, you know even you know unlimited amount uh, of, of cpu that's that's you know these big services are the only one that have this uh, scalability uh, but uh, for any company that is large enough and has the critical mass to have its own uh, computing or supercomputing resources of course internal solutions would be inexpensive but uh, you know the, the the inflection point by which you need to get before it makes sense for a company is fairly large because uh, you know any kind of internal cluster you need also to manage and so on so so the cloud is very nimble we can uh, you know deploy a solution at whatever scale we want, uh, basically any time. So that's the great advantage, I think. Okay, thanks a lot, Nicola. So uh, if there are no other uh, direct uh, questions from the audience, since we are uh, a bit late, uh, I would uh, start to close the this webinar. And uh, uh, of course, we'll be happy to take more questions. You can write us directly and I'll give you uh, our contacts uh, in, a, in a second. So uh, first of all, thanks to you all for attending, uh, attending this webinar. And thanks to all the speakers. I think the uh, seminars and talks were extremely interesting, at least to me. I hope it's the same for all the other attendees. And uh, uh, as we've been saying several times, Max is a user-centered uh, COE. So uh, please, we are happy to get feedback from the community and uh, we'll be welcoming you pretty much if you join our community here. Are uh, some ways to get in touch with the Max community. Uh, we have uh, LinkedIn, uh, web address, uh, um, and uh, Twitter and uh, a YouTube dedicated channel. And again, thank you all for the attention. Goodbye.